The what? So what is your full name, sir? William H. Willis. And where and when were you born? I was born in Utica, New York, <clears throat> June 25th, 1921. So how old are you currently? Now? I, my age now is 96 plus. <laughs> and which branch of the armed services did you serve in? Army and Air Force. And uh, which units were you associated with? When I first went in the Army, I was a field artillery. I played in the field artillery band, mm -hmm. played trombone. And when my transfer came through, I was changed to, I became a cadet here at the Santa Ana Army Air Base, known in those days. And they, uh, that was Army Air Corps. After World War II, they developed the Air Force, which we didn't have before that. And I was had an automatic transfer from Army Air Corps to Air Force. What did you do in the Air Corps? I flew, I went overseas in P-38s, flew strafing and cover for bombers and cover for ships during the Normandy landing. And about two weeks after that, they took our 38s away and gave us P-51s. What was the highest rank that you attained? My highest rank at that time was first lieutenant during the mil uh, during that active duty. I'm right now a lieutenant colonel. And how many missions did you did you fly? Mm, I don't know. The uh, bombers. Worked with missions. We worked with hours. And How many hours? Uh, let's see. Uh, I think there's 270 combat hours. I think that's the number. Okay. And did you receive any medals or commendations? Mm -hmm. Air medal and DFC. And, of course... We had ribbons for ETA, European the Theater. For here in the States, we had one for that. But as far as accommodations, that's all Air Medal and DFC. And what years did you serve from? One in the service. October 42, I went to reserve in late 44 and stay reserve in order to, to get college requirements so I could go back active duty. I didn't get back because combat was ending and they were had, having rifts, so I didn't get back in active duty. I stayed reserve. I have retired reserve. Um, let's talk about your childhood a little bit. Um, you said you grew up in Utica, New York. Um, no. You were born in... I was born there. Okay, so where did you grow up then? Well, I started there. I was five years old when my parents moved to Oregon. Spent a little time there, a little time in Washington. And uh, maybe for maybe two years, then Southern California until I was 11 years old. And then they moved back to upstate New York, farm country. And I stayed there 
until I, until I went to the military, where my first station was was in Kentucky. I was only there a couple months, and my transfer came through for for air training, cadet training, and I was sent from Kentucky to Southern California. And my feeling then was, I'm home. I'm just had been a kid out here. <laughs> now, did you have any siblings? Yes, I had one. I think I already described. He's a P-38 pilot and mm -hmm. in What's the Pacific. Name? John R. Willis. He was the first lieutenant when he was killed. And as a passenger. <laughs> So, I was my only sibling. And how was he killed? He was, he finished his tour flying P-38s in combat, and they were sending him to New Guinea to instruct replacements for combat. He hitched a ride on a military transport, and the pilot of the military transport flew into a mountain in Leyte, and they were all killed. And were you close with your brother growing up? Very. Very close. We used to double date and the whole bit. We belonged to a roller skating Waltz Club, and a few things like that. No, we, my brother and I were very close. Now, why did you guys move around uh, so much as a family? Well, my father had an interest in seeing something different, mm -hmm. and he was offered a job in Oregon. We got there and the place had closed up. <laughs> so, did some other things. He got work and so on. And, but there wasn't much in the Oregon area. So that's when we went to Washington where he got a job in the machine shop. It was, in, in uh, for ship repair and so on. And it was cold up there and he wanted to go south, so he came down here. <laughs> and he, he has a pretty good job down here. He, he's work, working for the city of Burbank. And he was running equipment when they built what's now called the Burbank Airport. Yeah. I remember when it was open field. <laughs> they, and he, he got, had some problems, medical problems, and we went east where his, his people were and bought a farm, and I learned to do farm work, to plow, to milk cows, hitch horses, so I did some of that. Now, during the Great Depression, uh, did you guys, as a family, did you guys have any, any hardships that you had to endure? Tell me about your experience during that time. Never too hard, but uh, I remember some of my friends in school had bicycles. We didn't have money for me to get a bicycle. So I found where there's an old beat up, a guy wanted to sell an old beat up bike, needed a lot of repair. <coughs> he wanted $3 for it. So I shoveled snow, 
mowed lawns and everything else to save up three dollars. How old were you at that? Which time? got spent for food. <laughs> uh, oh, I don't know. I was early teens. <clears throat> Eventually, I got the bike, repaired it. It's in good shape. And some of the boys found out that I repaired bikes. And I just learned that way because <laughs> I had to fix that one. They, and I... So I'd fix their bikes and they'd either pay me a little bit or give me an, an old bike they had laying around, which I'd repair and sell. So I got by pretty good. And the money that you made from that, did you were you able to keep that or, or did oh, you I have kept to go it. to the I kept it. Okay. There's only that one time when my father was away on a job. Funds ran a little low. And my mother got a little worried. I said, Here we are. Here's three dollars for food. She was thrilled to death and my father came home the next day, which was balanced out. So, oh, it wasn't long after that he he bought me a real nice bike. <laughs> but we, you know what it is in the Depression? We're, you're very careful about what you spend. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, did you graduate from high school? Yes, I did. In what year? Uh, nineteen forty two. So when the attack on Pearl Harbor occurred, where where were you? Uh, correction, that's nineteen forty one I graduated. Okay. From high school. Where was I? Uh, we were in a small village in West Sand Lake, New York, and I forget whether I was at home at the time or, but the news came on, I was told about it, and, and Heard there was something, and then of course, Franklin Delano Roosevelt came on with a big speech. And but the I was uh, I remember the incident. Do you remember what thoughts were going through your head at that time? And as a young man, joined the service. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. The, and I did. I, I took exams for uh, for air training, and it was a civilian place. I went through and tried to pass all that, and I did. The guy said, uh, the lieutenant in charge of the office, he said, we don't have any available place for you right now, but we'll give you a call so you come in and we'll swear you in. I said, the draft is getting mighty close. He said, well, we'll go over to the draft office and tell them what it is and have them take your name off the list. I went to the draft office. I said, we used to do that. We don't do it anymore. What was your name? A red check mark by my name. I took those tests for the year. I went through a physical and all on a Saturday. The following Saturday, I went through the same routine for the draft. Now they got out there to swear me in. Well, I wouldn't be a conscientious objector, so I got sworn in as a buck private. <laughs> and 
where or when were you sworn in? When? Yeah. Remember the date? No, it was either September or October. 1942, mm -hmm. and I wasn't. Uh, I was sent to right away. To get on the train and went to a camp Upton on the eastern end of Long Island, mm -hmm. and it was cold. They ran out of barrack space, so they put up a squad tent for us, and a few of us down at the end of the alphabet, like me, had to sleep in the pup tent with the GI bunk, the mattresses on, and one blanket. It was cold. <laughs> it was just shy of ice outside. And got ready for the next night. And we'd gone through a deal where they explained everything to us or got questions. And we were put in the train and headed out to an unknown spot. We didn't know where we were going. It's interesting that when I I was working in the federal arsenal in Waterville, New York, and the general in charge, and that's the military, so the general in charge, when we went, those of us who got drafted, he gave us a letter recommending us to ordinance. So I went through that routine at Camp Upton, and they ask you a lot of questions. You do this. You, did you play a musical instrument? And all that kind of regalia. And we got sent out. So I knew I was going to ordinance. And I wound up in Kentucky at Camp Breckenridge, no longer there. And we in the parking lot. They had a bunch of military vehicles, and the captain called out names and sent a bunch of guys down to where they had the big trucks with a cover and so on. They put me by a little weapons carrier all by myself. So when the captain walked by, I said, sir, am, am I going to ordinance? He said, what's your name? Good. He says, no, you're in the band. The band? He says, you are a musician, aren't you? I never considered myself one. He says, you better learn in a hurry. <laughs> Typical military. How did you feel about being in the band? Uh, not being the best musician. It was all right. I played in bands, mm -hmm. marching bands orchestras, and uh, played in dance bands. So I wasn't too concerned. It's just that I thought, sure, I was going to ordinance where I, I was more of an expert. What did you want to do? Like, what was your? I wanted to fly a plane. OK. So they told me one time, Wait till they get a, when they get a, a cadet base on, on your station, go there and we'll transfer your papers. It was a brand new camp, nothing there. So I wrote a letter back to, to the area where I took the test. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened that when several of us went through and took the tests, I was the number one man on top. So things went, there were a few guys at the bottom, they were out. They couldn't 
make it. And with this group of people, I was top man. So I was fortunate there. So I wrote the letter and the, the lieutenant, I never heard from him. I said, oh boy, now I wonder what's going on. So all of a sudden, one time, at noontime, when we were polishing instruments, and the band better be well polished, I'll tell you. We played every day, played retreat, and everything. We were always out marching. It was tough work, where everybody in the organization would be sent out in the daytime for a long march. They'd wake us up about 2 o'clock in the morning, and we'd take the same hike that the others did at night. So it was not an easy life, but it's enjoyable. You're you're part of the group, in other words. How long were you so, were you in the band for? Uh, I was only in the band for about six weeks, I guess. It wasn't for too long. And when the runner came from headquarters, called out uh, Private Willis, double time to headquarters. So I went in there, captain there, and I saluted him. He returned it. He said, you're being transferred. Well, was ordinance, I thought. I said, sir, ordinance? He says, no, you're a cadet. Oh, how guys! <laughs> the papers had been sent to one of the military base uh, airports, and they had forwarded the papers down there, and I got transferred. And then there was a problem. Captain said, "I don't know how to send you." He says, "Enlisted people." We pay their way. Officers have to pay their own way, get reimbursed later. A cadet is somewhere in between. I don't know what to do with you. They paid my way. And they sent me out here to the Santa Ana, Ana Arm Base, which is now the Orange County Fairgrounds. And they had a bunch of barracks there. And that's where I started. From there, they sent me. You started your training as a pilot there? There was no airport. It was pre-flight. The first thing they did, you go through, you go through a lot of training again mm -hmm. to see if you qualify. Before they even put you in a plane? Or at least oh, a plane wasn't there, done. Yeah. yeah. They check you out, go through a lot of deals for... One of the big things I remember was coordination. Mm -hmm. And they had some machines there. Some of them worked backwards. But I had ran machinery, lathes, milling machines, and so on. So it was pretty easy for me. So I had no problem. Then there were a lot of tests, or math, recognition of, of airplanes and ships and so on. And I got through okay. And when I finally got through, I was sent to, uh, what's the matter with me? My brain isn't working. It's up, uh, no problem. up north and just this side of, San Francisco boys, and that's what I started the primary. If you go through two months of primary training, and we're flying open cockpit, uh, there were Ryan low wing airplanes, and the you know, instructor sat up front, and the cadet in the back, and until you solo, and then you, nobody up front, just the cadet in the back. Tell me about your experience the first time you, you soloed. 
How did that feel? Great. The didn't bother me any, but I know the instructor caught hell, if you will, from the boys in charge because the wind was blowing and he wasn't supposed to solo anybody. But he did. And I just flew around. I shot one landing. He says, keep going. He stood on the side watching. And so actually, I had soloed a plane before. Uh, I was paying money just before I won the service. And I did flying in small planes. And I had soloed. But this was a bigger deal to me. And now, were they training you to pilot any specific plane? I know you ended up with the fighter planes, but not at that time, was it just general uh, they pilot training? You just pilot training. Mm -hmm. I had requested, every time they asked a request, even when I was over here in Santa Ana, I wanted to fly. Twin engine fighter. Well, we only had, a, for daytime, we only had a twin engine fighter. It's a P 38. <laughs> I just fell in love with what I saw. <laughs> and I went through the, let's see, from, that was King City, I mentioned, where we uh, flew those. I started in flying. From there, they sent me to Merced, where we flew. A BT 13s. And from there, I was sent to what we call them Williams Field, Arizona, mm -hmm. where we flew some flew some planes, pilot and co pilot type thing. And we, for gunnery, we flew the North American AT-6. And then they had some planes there, RP-322, that was, that looked like a P-38, exactly the same, but it didn't have any supercharger. So it was limited in power. And we did that. I graduated, let's see, I think my graduation was November, I believe, of 43. Became a second lieutenant. And for training in the P-38, I was sent up to, to Merced, and we flew there. Finished there, and they sent me to what was then Grand Central Air Terminal in Glendale. It's closed up. And from there, they sent us to Ontario, the whole unit from Glendale got transferred to Ontario and we lived in tar paper barracks, open bay tar paper, tar paper barracks. And one time <coughs> I just landed a plane, walked in to check the plane in and the captain at the desk looked at my lists and so on. He says, how many hours did you get in there? I told him, hmm. He says, go out and sit in one of those planes and log in an hour and 40 minutes. Don't fly it. Just log it in as if you did fly it. So I went out and did what he said. So I went back, he says, did you do it? Yes, I did. 
Oh, you're okay. You're you're ready to ship out, going to combat. <laughs> so, <clears throat> just two or three days later, a bunch of us got a train and headed out. Were you the only one that that they put through that process of sitting in the plane for that time? I don't know. I don't know. I never checked. Yeah. It didn't matter. Yeah. So, I think in, we were on a train, and the military, when they, or the government, when they authorized railroads way back a century or so ago, or more, they uh, set it up in many of them, okay, that's fine, military rides free or at a low price. So that was still in effect. So you get aboard a train and you don't go straight through, you go this way on all the freebies. And this one got loaded on the train and went down through uh, into Texas and El Paso, and from there the train headed north in Texas, and the train stopped a couple times. Nowhere, no, they just stopped. So finally, a few of us got out on one of these stops to find out what was going on, and they were had hot bearings in the in the drivers on the engine, and they didn't have any grease. So they'd stop and spray water on it to cool it down, then go a little further. So the engineer said, okay, I guess we're ready to go again. Well, we're standing by the engine, two of us. Wait till we get aboard. He said, don't have time, climb aboard here. So we climbed up and rode the engine which was a different experience, and it was fun. And those big engines, the steam engines, you would be interested in the fact that they keep moving from left to right and so on to stay on the track, and you can only see, looking alongside the boiler, you only see the track part of the time because it's oscillating back and forth. But we got to New York, and they put us in, the, forget the name of it, there's a little fort, well, named fort, in the uh, southwest corner of Long Island. So we hung out around there for week, 10 days, I guess, before we got aboard a ship. Just that meant every night in Manhattan. <laughs> and a lot to do there. Uh, and uh, so we got aboard ship. And the ship we were on had some problems. And finally, had to leave the convoy, and we went to Newfoundland, where they repaired it. When we went back out, we joined a uh, joined a another convoy. Um, uh, one for no troops, or just uh, carrying stuff, products, and so on. The uh, so we were, we were the only troop ship, so we're moving along at a much slower pace. I was, along, two or three of us were given the job, what they called, a, ah, let's see. I forget now, but in, in any event, I had to follow the old Navy rules of, uh, 
four on and eight off. And I was responsible in the four hours for rowing the deck and making certain everything is proper. Now let me ask you, when did you find out that you were headed to Europe instead of the Pacific? When uh, I was heading to where? When did you find out which theater you were you were being uh, sent to? I we only assumed where we were going when we were on the train heading east. Right. We assumed, yeah. and once we're stationed on Long Island, we were pretty certain we were heading east. Right. Did you have a, a preference or? It didn't matter to you? Not really. We thought it would, if we went east, though, we wouldn't have a language barrier because we'd be in England. The, uh, But the interesting thing when I was on the ship there and duty, I was way up on the boat deck on top, and all of a sudden, uh, felt the ship shake a little bit and felt some noise. So I, I ran around the other side to take a look. And one of those container ships had the bow sticking up out of the water. He'd taken a torpedo. We just made a turn. If we hadn't made the turn, our ship would have got it. So we got, we made it on through Landed in Scotland. When did you land in Scotland? Do you remember the, the date? No, I don't date. remember the date, but it was it was springtime. Forty four. In forty four, yes. And they sent us to a place to where they kind of give us training for for the work we had to do. And my, about two or three of my buddies and myself were all sent to the 55th Fighter Group. So we were still together. Did you make and pretty close friends? One of my very good friends. We were like brothers. What was his name? Clifford Williams. He passed away two or three years ago. And you kept in touch with him? Oh, yes. Throughout after the war? And we had, we had military reunions that we'd go to. Mm -hmm. We don't have them anymore. We can't find enough people. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> well, I'm not going to put down that break. Oh, yeah. Okay, so when we left off, uh, we were in Scotland. In, arrived in Scotland. Well, we got sent, we took the train to a, a place in England, just north of the Wash. Mm -hmm. And that's where we were trained for, for the organizations we were going to fly combat. Then we were. What did that training involve? Basically, formation. I think the interesting thing while I was there, there was a German bombers came over, and there was a city north of us that they used, I guess, for training and practice, and they did a lot of bombing on it. So. The, uh, our barracks were Quonset huts, those round things. And they, uh, we got the notice to seek shelter. And the British system, uh, they had a, a big company for their, uh, for broadcasting and so on. Was Tannoy. 
So you get the call, Tannoy, Tannoy, Tannoy. This station is under red alert. Seek shelter. Then that was repeated again. So we saw the bombers and heard the warning. And there's a bomb shelter right outside our barracks. So we beat it out there to the air raid shelter. It was a big dirt mound where we found that we could stand on top of that. We did just what we were supposed to. We went to the air raid shelter, but we stood on top of it instead of getting in it and watched the excitement. <laughs> Stupid Yanks. <laughs> So that was the big event there, I guess. They, uh, from there, we were sent to <coughs> different organizations. I was sent to the 55th Fighter Group, 343rd Fighter Squadron. And I got assigned as Blue Four. What is that representative? Here's this a position of flying where you become tail and Charlie, and in combat could be one of the first ones to get shot down. <laughs> How'd you feel about that? Well, I was not nervous, but uh, very curious. So our first mission we took off and they flew it as, I guess, a fighter sweep. Didn't matter when any Germans came up. So we just flew around. I flew the position. We came back in and landed. So the, the missions, when you would go, were, were you mainly escorting bombers? Not at that time. I think... You, what was the purpose of, your, of the missions at that point? Uh, they... Periodically, we'd go out trying to encourage German fighters to come up mm -hmm. with, and try to get them where their bombers weren't around so there was fewer fighters You're trying to, to get to the bombers. Got it. And there weren't any. We just flew around and the skippers... Uh, those organizations will very would do that very often when they get new several new people in to fly them around and let them see what it is before they send them in a a real good mission. Was it to, to sort so of help put them at ease a bit. Yeah, I suppose. Now the the first time you flew uh, your first mission, uh, do you remember the the thoughts going through your head? Was there any nervousness or apprehension or? My previous instructions were be sure you swivel your neck and take a look behind up above to see who's diving down at you. So I did plenty of that. Of course, I did that all the way through. So <laughs> but it was just normal eventually. This I had to think about it. And uh, nothing happened other than a a flight across the channel into France, pull around and run back. How yeah. long would those flights be? Oh, I don't know. Probably only real short, only two or three hours, I guess. And how long could, um, these were P-38s? Yes. Um, and, and how long could a P-38 fly for? Oh, I guess the longest time I ever spent in one was about seven, seven and a half hours. Mm -hmm. We had we had wing tanks, drop tanks, and uh, it had a pretty good range, a range to a point where our outfit. <clears throat> It's in the, when they determined who was going to fly where and so on, we were target and return for the bombers very often. And that was the hardest job. 
uh, sometimes we were lucky and we escorted the bombers going in. Uh, your target areas they have what they call a flak circle. They have a flak guns around a big circle out of ways. And when the flak comes up, there's no enemy fighter is going to fly through the flak. And then we, we can only pr protect the bombers from them. So we didn't fly through it either. And the bombers had to fly through it. And we've, s we've seen planes get hit. Then our big job was to count shoots, if any. As I've seen planes lose a wing and go down spinning. And probably not too many got out. They were entrapped in the plane when it hit the ground. So, but that, that was later on became interesting. So like I say, our primary job was escorting. But then we've gone out for, for strafing. And I've watched steam come out of locomotives where I put holes through them. <laughs> the, uh, the, it was, uh, I was like, thinking about the, the strafing, it was always kind of an enjoyable thing. To, oh, they also, Instead of a drop tanks, we'd put bombs under them. We could either carry one or two. Of course, if you carry two, your your range is cut. You carry one, your range is also cut because you only have one drop tank. So, <coughs> but is a drop tank essentially a fuel tank that you you would get rid of after you drop it when it, after you exhaust all the yes fuel. got it and. So we'd carry a thousand pound bomb under each wing mm -hmm. and we've dropped those various places like on bridges and so on and to destroy their transportation system. And on the, in what marshalling yards, those stations where they keep all their, well, over there they call them goods wagons. Ours are freight train, but to try to destroy as much of their railroad mm -hmm. as possible. Now, how many other uh, fighter planes would be in your formation or, or group on any particular mission? Well, the 55th Fighter Group, we would put up the, uh, we had three squadrons. And each squadron would, would have four flights of four planes each. So there'd be 16 planes for each squadron. So the three squadrons would give us 48 planes. Plus, when you first take off, you wind up with spares. It would fly along in case somebody has engine trouble and drops out the spare will flow into place. And that, uh, that was a good deal, yeah. It's, and uh, oh, at one time, they put a Norton bomb site in one of the RP-38s and borrowed a bombardier from a B-24 bomber unit and put them in the nose of the B-38. And we'd fly at eh, 25,000 feet and drop bombs, same as a bomber. Uh, from that high up? We, oh, that's not high. 25,000 or 2,500? 25, 25,000, okay. five miles. 
and the bombers would usually be oh anywhere from 24 to 27,000 and we'd be flying above them giving them protection so things on the ground got a little small oh no at 2500 those guys down below are dead shots yeah. they could almost use a pistol <laughs> that's too close <laughs> The uh, the type of radar they had was pretty good even at the altitude, but uh, the it was we did a reasonably good job at that, and then when the invasion started, I'm talking about the D-Day invasion. Yes. When that was underway, <clears throat> we flew cover over the ships, same as we were flying over the bombers, to avoid the enemy planes coming in on the ships. And uh, in essence, I had a balcony seat for the landing, the invasion. I could look down, and fortunately, uh, I was up too high to see casualties. But I saw some of those landing craft pretty well beat up. <laughs> I watched shell fire from, from the shore with the German 88s. I saw them hit the water. I never see how shit get hit. But they'd hit the water and make a big geyser of water. I watched the battleships fire broadside at land to try to stop the 88s. <laughs> so it was a nice experience. Those of us who lived through it, it was a nice experience. Did you encounter any uh, enemy fighter planes? I only saw one German plane all the time I was there. And that was an experimental or a test plane. It was a rocket. And he was moving at a very fantastic speed. We couldn't touch him. It was, it, it was quite a deal. I, that particular day I saw that, I was assigned a position with the headquarters, 55th Fighter Group. Uh, I <clears throat> put on bomber fighter intercom. So I was the guy who would transfer, information. If the bomber people would call me, I'd have to transfer it to the to those of us in the fighters or if fighter commands call me, I'd have to transfer it to the bomber. And that time I saw this plane coming and when I looked out it's maybe using the clock about one o'clock, one thirty. And we use the clock, you know, to dis describe the angle of where other things were. Mm -hmm. And this is about one or one thirty. And I saw the plane, I switched to to uh, a, a report uh, to the fighters called in uh said a, there's a plane approaching rapidly, or a plane coming. It took told him one. I said, and he seems to be moving very fast. And comment came back, wow, let's go home. Wow. <laughs> and plus other people, I could hear them on the, uh, calling on the radio. And he flew right straight across in front of us. And I'm sure that German pilot was showing off. He didn't have the guns to shoot us. And he knew we couldn't touch him. He's going too fast. So I think it was just, hey, guys, take a look at this. And just to make you aware of it. Those planes, they 
took off in a carriage and left the carriage behind and had to land on a ski under the fuselage. It was quite a plane, fast. But they couldn't stay in the air very long. The fuel was used up very fast. So then about two weeks after the invasion, they took our 38s away and gave us B-51s. How'd you feel about that? Uh, I didn't like it. If P-38 had two engines, if one quits, you can still go home. P-51, if one quits, you stop. Yeah. However, after a few missions, we took a big liking to the plane. It was a very nice plane. The engine was dependable. That what was the reason for, for switching at that time? The, um, I was, we were 8th Air Force, which took care of the bombers and so on. The 9th Air Force was the ground support. They support the troops on the ground, do the strafing and so on. And the P-38 was by far the best plane for that. So the 9th Air Force already had some 38s, but they had some other planes as well. So they got rid of the other planes and gave everybody they could a P-38. And the, the length of time and cost of building a P-38 it was more than a P-51 or P-47. So we got the P-51s and then we had a problem. It was very maneuverable, but it, it didn't lack the, the distance of that you had with the 38. So we couldn't go as far with the bombers. We were limited. And then about a week after that, they added a fuselage tank right behind the pilot. I forget um, what it was, I think 65 gallon. And that gave us the range. The only problem was it made the plane very unstable. It, you couldn't relax in it. You had to fly it constantly. Yeah. And instrument flying, that created a, a bit of information. You, to watch those instruments and hang onto that stick was something else. It was, I saw because of that instability, I've seen some of the boys spin in and wreck the plane and probably them too. It was, it was quite a deal. Flying was completely different. It was, it was a pilot's airplane. It wasn't any novice plane. <laughs> now you mentioned earlier um when you were es escorting the bombers and you'd start to experience flak, um, would you guys pull back at that point? We'd, we'd go around the target and pick them up on the other side. Got it. There's that no point in us flying through. Yeah. The bomber could take hits and a lot of damage and keep on flying. And you could help them home uh, with the damage. With our planes, well, a good example, both planes had, had uh, liquid-cooled engines. The bombers all had air-cooled engines, radials. P-51, P-38 were inline liquid-cooled engines, and they had radiators. All you had to do 
was to put a, a little hole in one of those radiators and all that liquid would uh, go, uh, you'd lose it all. That engine would heat up and freeze. And that has happened. The P-38, our P-51 had that scoop underneath and we didn't like flying through flak with that. The 38, if you did that with one engine, you still had another engine. That wasn't the nicest thing that happened to you, but but the 51, I've seen planes with that white coming out behind it like mad. It was the coolant for the engine. And when that's gone, boy, that engine freezes up solid. So what was the in indicator um, for you guys to, to go around? when the flak started coming. Did you see it? Did you hear it? Did you? What you did could you see it. And depended on the rest of the flight, you, you stayed, held your position in formation. And the flight leader takes the whole group around. Well, that's fine. Uh, Were you guys behind the bombers on the sides and front all around? Where was your We'd position fly. in relation to the bombers? We, some of the organ, some would assign side, some above. Somehow or other, I got below the bombers one time, and I watched the bomb bay doors come open. I got out of there in a hurry. You don't want to be underneath it when that happens. Hey. But... We normally didn't fly under them. It was some people were assigned to cover the top and others assigned to cover the side. And the, I've flown through flak. I didn't like it. Did your plane ever get, get hit by any of it? I never got hit, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of metal. When this, that explodes, yeah. there's a lot of metal and with my P-38, I flew through the area and picked up a piece of flak in one of my fillets. I didn't even know it. It was just, just happened. Incidental. We got back, my crew chief said, here, Lieutenant. I said, what's that? It's flak. And it was spent flak. It didn't, it was just in the air and, and I ran into it. And when you're flying, of course, we flew at, uh, our speed was low in those days. There's only, I was only doing uh, the uh, normal speed, 250, 260. But if you hit something like that, it's going to put a dent in there. Sure. <laughs> uh, now, were there any other uh, fighter pilots that... that had gotten hit or shot Oh, yes. Yes. They've, we've had quite a few of them go down. Did you lose any of your buddies? Oh, yes. Yes. I did. Uh, this close buddy of mine that we were like brothers, he's dead now, but I guess about two years ago I lost him. Uh, he went down, and the, the French picked him up and hit him. And when, after the invasion, when our troops moved into that area, he was there. He came out. I talked to his son occasionally. He's in Texas. They, but uh, it's one of the bad ones, I think, is one of the guys, every evening in the barracks, I'd play poker with him, and it bothers as well. But this guy was always at the poker table. He got shot down. 
and the German farmers in the area pitchforked him to death. Uh, that's always bothered me. And so yes, I lost a few people, a few friends. Did um, at any point did you ever fear for your own life? No. I've taken evasive action and I've thought of it at night uh, back in the barracks or something. When you're driving down the road, freeway or otherwise, and somebody pulls around in front of you or something, do you get scared or do you take evasive action? You react. That's it. You just react. You don't. You don't get scared at that time. You just react to the situation. And uh, there's one time I was doing some strafing for the P-51. And as I pulled up, I could see the tracers going by my left wing tip. So I took evasive action, got out of there. My wingman was coming down and he called me on the radio and said, Bill, if you want to make another pass, he won't bother you anymore. At that time, I, I thought it was great. Here we took out an enemy. Since I've got older, I got to thinking that that guy had a family. Parents, maybe he was married, I don't know. In any event, he take the news the same as the rest of us when one of us lost a family member. And I've got to thinking it's too bad a war is such a nature that we killed that poor guy. Yeah. He was doing the same as the rest of us. He had orders to man that gun, and he was doing exactly what he was supposed to do. But he'd never bother anybody again. <laughs> yeah, they... And they got done there. <coughs> they came back to the States for a new assignment. And that one I was hoping wouldn't happen, but it did. I got sent to Bakersfield as an instructor for cadets. When did you get sent back to the States? Was it before the war had ended? Oh, yes. War. The war was still on. It was Uh, I think I got back it was late forty late forty four mm -hmm. sometime and, and why uh, were you sent back home? I got 270 hours, and they were doing that to everybody. So you earned you earned enough points, essentially. To yeah, so I came back and wound up at Bakersfield, flying cadets, mm -hmm. and I found that in some cases could be more dangerous than flying combat. <laughs> uh, not really, because if you're a proper instructor, you keep a good check. But I've I've witnessed some things, like the last turn into the field. We've had people spin in, 
and kill themselves. Uh, see, uh, I don't know, there's so many things have happened with when I was flying cadets. Uh, okay. And when you were overseas, did you ever become homesick at all? Did I what? Become homesick at all? Did you miss? No. no. Staying too active. Mm -hmm. The uh, In the daytime, you, you go out on a mission. You didn't go out every day because there were other people who would take your place and so on. But you had that. And then there were times when you get two or three days off. You go to London. I think I had a week or two weeks. They sent me to Scotland. We had about four or five days after Paris had been released to us. I spent a couple of days in Paris. And that was an ordeal going there. <coughs> Good buddy of mine was also going. And we we're going to take one P 51. So I flipped a coin to see who was going to fly down and the other one fly back. And it meant you. Strip the radio out, and one guy sits on that little shelf, leaning over like this, right over the, here's the pilot's head. So you're sitting in back, and you wear a, a chest pack. So he won the flip going. So we went down to Villa Coblet, just south of Paris, and he landed. Coming back, he had to sit back there, and I flew it back. <laughs> so you got to see a little bit of Paris? We spent a few days in Paris, yes. Are there any other, any other instances or memories of your time overseas that stick out in your memory? Uh... No, I, uh, it's one thing, I, sitting there <coughs> waiting for takeoff, wingman behind me there and got a flagman there. When everything was clear down the runway, he'd give the flag to go ahead and I'm looking over his head, we had triangular field mm -hmm. and all the, all center, all dirt and so on. So I'm looking over there and here came a 51. Boom! Hit the ground fast and hard. Not the hose, that poor pilot. So I'm sitting there and here all of a sudden I saw some feet. Came down. When his feet touched the ground, I knew he was in a parachute. But the parachute was still in the overcast. I couldn't see it. <laughs> Pretty low ceiling. And that's when we took up. We'd take off like that with very low ceilings. And you're on instruments when you pull the gear, landing gear up. <laughs> this and a bit of fun. We, did you write home at all? Write? Yeah, did you write to your Oh, family? sure. That was one of the things. The, uh, you'd write the letter home and, and get mail. Then evening, in my case, about every evening while I was there, was spent at a table with six other guys playing poker. <laughs> yeah.
And uh, so I did all right. I sent some money home playing poker. There you go. The, this guy who got pitched for to death was one of those guys. Um, so that was about life. It, was, it wasn't all that bad. You mentioned you had about 270 hours of, of flight time. If you had to estimate how many actual flights you made for those hours, what do you think that would be? I don't know. I didn't I haven't bothered to check that one out. The uh, the bombers, they, I think, they all had thirty missions, mm -hmm. and bomber pilots always want to know how many missions we flew, but it was more time oriented. They, I think it was two hundred and seventy. It might have been 300. I, I forget now. It's 270 or 300. Uh, I think at one time it was the 270 and they changed to 3. And then back again. Uh, military makes changes. So were you able to keep in, in touch with your brother at all? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we would write a letter. It'd take quite a while to get there, but yeah. Yes. And w what year was it when when his plane went down? Uh, Nineteen forty-five. So you'd already been back home. Yes. He went. He went down on on uh, March fifteenth. 1945, and every year that flag is at half staff that day. How did that affect you when you, you learned of the, the news? Well, I was saddened, but I'd lost friends, and it was lost other friends, and well, that's it. Of course, I was hurt. But we've all lost buddies. I'm sure you have along the line. But what is probably get to us, sadly, since we've been married. My wife and I had three daughters, and we lost them by natural causes. <laughs> so that hit us hard. I guess that's about it. That's, as far as flying, uh, how long were you doing cadet training for when you returned home? Oh, I was, I guess about four or five months, six months. I don't know. The Was it up until the end of the war in Europe? The war had ended, yes. And that's what caused me to go to reserve. The I kept about once or twice a week in our mailbox uh, there'd be a note there <coughs> You wanna get out or stay in? I kept putting down stay in, stay in, stay in. Finally the 
the c commander of that base was a bird colonel. And he got us together and said, those of you who are interested, or keep asking to stay in. I won't recommend anybody for uh, for a regular commission unless he has a minimum of two years of college. I didn't have any college. And those of us like myself were assigned temporary commissions, not regular. I uh, well, I'll just take reserve, get my two years of college, and go back in. I tried it, and they were having roofs, getting rid of people. So I didn't get back. So uh, reserve. And I was flying out of San Bernardino as a reserve, where I was instructor and instrument check pilot. And the guys would be waiting for me to go there. And I just periodically would show up. And in the ready room, I'd walk in and be about four or five guys waiting for me. So I'd have to fly them around. Most of them wanted instrument check. So I'd have to take them out on instrument check. See how well I could fly instruments. <laughs> now, did you ever go back to active duty? Or you spent the rest of your Never career? Never did. On, on no. Career? No, I went through school. Instead of two years, I went for five years. And what I'm, did you end up doing a for work? I have a master in engineering, mechanical engineering. And I worked at Douglas Aircraft, Aerojet, and I finally wound up at Ford Aeronutronics. They're gone now. Remember, Ford was over here on the hill. And I worked there for a while. And Ford closed the place up, sold it. It's all bulldozed now. It's not there anymore. So that was my last military. Well, my last job. My last military was San Bernardino, an instrument check, an instructor. Now tell me, how did you meet your wife? Hi. She lived across the street from us in Waterville, New York. And uh, she married my brother. Then when my brother got killed, we joined hands, and she didn't have to change her name again. <laughs> We've only been married 72 years. Excuse me. Is there anybody in the garage? Yes, Carrie's in the garage. Yeah. Okay. You have any advice for for a long-lasting marriage? Be compatible. That's all I can say. Compatibility is always the easiest way. <laughs> Doesn't always work, but. But I, I never had any designs on anybody else, or, and I don't think she has. <laughs> Who have you been chasing? <laughs> so no, they. Just, we've lasted a good long time. And, of course, she's young yet. 
she's only 94. It's still a kid. <laughs> now, if you had any advice for, for my generation or, or future generations, what, what could you offer? Pick a dream and work toward it. And one thing I would say, having grown up in the Depression, we know what it is to be short of funds. And when I worked, I had friends who'd buy a new car every year. Some of them bought airplanes, some Boats, one, a very beautiful sailboat, expensive thing. And they grow up having a lot of fun. Uh, we actually set some of our money aside and I like big cars, but we bought them one or two years old. It's a lot less money, and there are only a few miles on them. It's practically a new car, and you get a very good price. And we spent a lot of time camping. We'd go up to the mountains, go up to Sequoia and so on, put up a tent. Very enjoyable, very nice life. But that's all I could say would think ahead. Try to save a little bit because when you get as old as my wife and I, you're not working anymore. The income you, you don't have that big income you do from work, so you better have some kind of a backup. That's probably the best advice I could give anybody. Wonderful. Now, is there anything else that anybody may want to prompt? Grandma? That little lady not only is her granddaughter, she's also a grandma. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. together and if it's more important to one you give in and you learn to accept it because it makes the other person happy so you just give it up not only that is uh, when you get out of the service you go to school studying for that doctor's calling me again turn it off